Alright, so now we are live again. Alright. And just double checking the stream here. I have to wait for a 12 second ad, guys. Sorry about the uh, problems. If you can hear us, we are working on the technical issues. Um, just waiting for the ad to finish for me to double check it. Alright, looks good to me. My side's moving. How about you? Look good? Um, yes, looks good. All right, awesome. Cool. We can oh, go. Nice. All right, so sorry about that, guys. Thank you for coming back and tuning in again. Uh, so let me go ahead and start over. <laughs> we have a very special guest with us today. It is National Master Martin Hansen from Florida, Orlando. Now, he is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my years of chess, and um, he does a lot for the chess community as well. So, uh, Martin, please uh, go ahead and tell us about yourself, uh, what it is that uh, you do for school, work, and what got you into chess. Yes. Uh, well, to start off, uh, yeah, I'm a national master up here in Orlando, for those who don't know me already. Um, I did just finish my MBA, uh, so I just completed graduate school. So hopefully I'm done with school for a little while. Um, and outside of that, for work, uh, I've been working in accounting, financial analysis. I'm looking for an opportunity right now, uh, doing a couple of interviews. So it's actually been a pretty busy week. Um, but hopefully uh, looking forward to, uh, to getting something settled uh, pretty soon. Um, and other than that, you know, after graduate school, I had a little bit more time for chess. You know, I hadn't really had a lot of time during, uh, you know, the time when I was both studying and working. So I was really ready and eager to play a lot of chess. And then suddenly there was no tournament to be found. You know, everyone, everything was closed over the board because of, uh, of COVID. Yeah. So what I ended up deciding was, you know, if I can't play any uh, tournaments, maybe I should organize something myself. And um, that led to, you know, the tournaments that I created myself. Started out with a knockout event, invited most of the masters in the uh, the central Florida area that I knew, a couple of others that I knew from different parts of Florida. And uh, we ended up having a great event, one by Dalton Perrine. It was a knockout blitz event. Mm -hmm. And because of, uh, of that, you know, that was pretty successful. I enjoyed it. People seemed to have a good time playing and uh, watching. Um, I ended up, you know, organizing more events after that. We had a match against Chicago. We have a match coming up against Detroit, which is starting this weekend. And uh, now we have the Master Blitz League as well where uh, 24 of the top players in Florida are going to be playing um, group stage matches. So everyone's going to get at least five matches and uh, just have a chance to play some chess while there are no, you know, over the board tournaments. Yes, absolutely. And guys, big shout out to he and his Twitch stream, Orlando Chess House. Go ahead and check it out. He's on there quite often doing commentary and playing. So if you want to get some good insight from him, I definitely recommend it. Uh, yes. From what I remember, you also have a father who plays chess. Go ahead and tell us about him. Uh, in fact, both my parents play a lot of chess. Um, my dad is indeed a grandmaster, Lars Bohansen, who has also won the, the state championship a couple of times. Uh, my mom's a women's international master, so both of them with uh, FIDE titles. All right. And uh, that gave me a, uh, you know, a proper chess upbringing, which meant that um, I was introduced to the game from a pretty young age. I started you know, playing a little bit when I was around seven or eight. I think seven. Mm -hmm. And um, I've just always enjoyed chess. You know, it's always been something that I really loved. You know, I love playing. I love following the uh, the top events. Um, and uh, it's just always been a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. And in the teaching aspect, too, I know that you do a lot of teaching. Uh, I have done some coaching. Yeah, it hasn't really been my main priority, uh, particularly with grad school. I didn't really have time to do a whole lot, but I have had right. a few private students here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that, you know, I did consider if I should try to do more actively um, again. But um, yeah, it's not something I've done a lot of. I've been uh, coaching at a lot of the camps. My parents have been organizing a lot of camps in the last couple of years. Yep. And uh, I've been, you know, assisting them. But um, other than that, you know, it's more about organizing and, and displaying for me at this point. Right. And I'm very excited to see what you have to share uh, with us today and uh, yes. with your very strong chess background here. So uh, go ahead and tell us what we are going to start with. Yeah. So um, as I was saying, also on the Facebook post that I, uh, that I put up for, uh, for the interview today, uh -huh. um, my style is mostly a positional kind of style. I play the French, I play the Alpin, which are both, you know, leading to a lot of, uh, you know, slow grinds. You know, yep. you get a lot of end games where I'm slightly better, perhaps, and I try to grind them down in like the sixth hour of play or something. And a lot of those games I really enjoy, but perhaps not the most fun to share. So I did manage to dig through my database and find one game that at least illustrates some... Uh, you know, swashbuckling, attacking chess for me uh, with the black pieces against one of the, 
the top young guys in the state, Marvin Gao. I think he was around eight or nine when this game was played. And uh, of course, you always want to, you know, do well. You, you never really want to lose to to one of the the kids, even though they're very strong. And, and I'm sure he's going to be a lot better than me someday. It's always nice to get a win. Yeah. <laughs> so the game I'll share here is a game uh, that I played with Black. Um, he played one e four. The thing I noticed when playing Marvin, I played him a couple of times, and he's always incredibly well prepared. Okay. Um, I'm always a little bit surprised at how, like, he was just blitzing out the opening moves, particularly in the other game I was playing. I played against him where he played like 17 moves of theory, mm -hmm. and I still managed to win in the end, but just very well prepared. So you say so you're playing this, as black here? Here in this game, I played as black. So okay, you can I'll go ahead and flip the board. board. Awesome. All right. So this and... will just be a little bit of a warm up because it's a pretty quick game. So right, I'll cool. just, uh... Uh, just real quick, I want to know um, some of the set the stage here, like where where is this uh, game played and so on. This game was played, I think, at the Sunshine Summer Open 2017. This one will just be a quick appetizer before the main game. That I'm All right, let's so go, let's go. It has a little bit less of a backstory. Uh, the other two will have a little bit more, but um, it was still a, an interesting game here. Um, I obviously really wanted to do well. Yeah. And so um, I played the French as I usually do uh, these days. I've played a couple of different things, but the French is my main opening, as people who follow my stream will know. Mm -hmm. um, Marvin went knight of three. Normally d4 is the main move, of course, but knight of three is, is also playable. And he goes for this line. And um, e5, knight d7, d4. So now it transposes into some of the normal French positions that you can get, um, let's say, something like this, where he just goes um, knight of three instead of the main move f4. Okay. And knight of three is a very playable move here. It's not the main idea because you don't really solidify your center as much, but it's actually um, quite serviceable. And so I go c5, and white takes it. And this is kind of the point. There were, I don't know if, if, you're, if you've read my system by Nimzovic and, and all of those things dating back to then, but there was kind of the idea that if white can take on c5 and gain good control over d4 and, mm -hmm. and some of those squares, he's going to be doing well. And so this is kind of what this opening is based on. Gotcha. So um, I took back on c5. Apparently, knight c6 is also pretty common, but all of these things tend to transpose. Mm -hmm. um, bishop d3 was played. I developed hitting the pawn on e5, bishop f4. And so this position, very standard in the French. You know, you probably don't want to castle here, because if you do, you immediately get hit by this Greek gift attack, Oof, which is uh, very well known. I, I, I know Sammy loves to talk about that. <laughs> um, Sammy's also, you know, working with you guys over there in Palm Beach. and. Uh, <laughs> So this is a very uh, standard attacking idea for white, knight g5. And um, at this point, if, if black goes back, queen h5, and this uh, mate is already going to be a big problem for black. In fact, I think it's unstoppable. All right, ouch. <laughs> so the one way you kind of have to deal with this usually is to go forward. But here, I think it runs into something like queen d3. Mm -hmm. And you're likely just going to get mated here uh, because something like this is mate. And you know, f5, I'm guessing he takes. And it doesn't look pretty. Like, it would be so difficult to defend that. <laughs> exactly. So you don't really want to allow that. But the very standard idea in the French here is to go f6 and immediately challenge white center. So the point of, you know, this whole setup for white is that um, he does have more space with the pawn on e5. You know, that's why if I castle, he can use this additional space to immediately swing the pieces over to attack. Mm -hmm. But in this position, I go f6 we challenge the center. And this is theory as well. It's well known. Um, so he takes, I take the knight and... Um, White castles and black castles. So all of this has been played in the Lee Chess database with Master Games. It's been played almost 200 times already. Right. But here, um, my opponent makes sort of a big mistake, and he goes rook e1. So to sort of think about this position um, the way I sort of think about it, it's, it's a very interesting strategic battle you get in these lines because um, it all hinges on this control that white has right now over the square in e5 and the square in e4. Um, that's really what this position is all about. So white right now is controlling the square in e5 with the knight, um, which is why a lot of times you see the main move on the database here is actually to play knight to e5 right away. Okay. But the point is, as long as white is controlling those squares, he can put some pressure on black. He has more space. He's got some squares for his pieces. But if black ever gets to uh, remove that blockade and push for e5 mm -hmm. and not losing any pawns, you know, either losing the e5 pawn or the d5 pawn, Black is immediately going to be at least fine and usually somewhat better. Okay. So the whole point of this, and it typically leads to like a slow strategic battle, is uh, is these squares. And so white will go knight e5. Black um, starts by developing, but then later will often go something like bishop d6 or something just try to challenge these squares. And sometimes like late into the end game, there's still a fight going on whether black will ever be able to go e5. Okay. 
So Eric kind of understands this idea, uh, which is why he plays rook to e1. Um, also trying to further his control with his e5 square, which is very important. Now, the problem with putting the rook on e1, though, is that black also has other ideas, namely the fact that right now the bishop on c5 and the rook on the open f file are both pointing towards that f2 square. Mm -hmm. And so already he's weakening that a little bit with this rook move, which is why it's never been played before in those 200 games. And um, at this point, I, I immediately you know, felt like there could be some, uh, some issues for white just based on those ideas. Okay. Um, so what I did here was, you know, I took a deep think and I found a way to do it, which was very concrete, which is I went for this E5 move directly. And the point is, there are just so many loose pieces here and loose squares for white. For instance, the bishop is loose in a lot of squares. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's undefended. It's just if you move the knight, you know, uh, I'm already attacking the bishop. Uh, but you have to be fast about it. Let's say I go knight G4, white goes bishop G3. Probably not quite fast enough, and, and White can do certain things of his own. Okay. So pushing this pawn to e5, if it works, um, which it does, is, is just, you know, it's the plan that Black wants to do. You're also threatening to go e4. And um, it just, uh, you know, uses tactically the fact that this pawn is loose um, on f2. So there are a couple of ways White can react to this. He pretty much has to take. Otherwise, uh, e4 would be a move next if he goes something like this. We mm -hmm. win a piece. I feel like it's odd to get an attacking position from the French. It is kind of <laughs> odd. That's why, you know, that's why it took me so much digging to find one here. But <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. We'll, we'll take it. Um, it is a pretty short game. So I pushed e5. And so he has um, basically two ways he can try to take it. Uh, one is with the knight is what he did. And the other is with the bishop. So the point of taking with the bishop is that there's no loose bishop on f4, right. but it kind of runs into the same tactics, uh, which is bishop takes f2, uh, which is the whole point. Oh. Uh, he kind of has to take. And then we take an e5. If he takes with the knight, um, I think it runs into knight to g4. Mm -hmm. Probably. It run, I think it runs into this. A lot and, of potential um, discover attacks, right? It runs in discovered attacks, and if he goes back, um, we give this check over here. <laughs> we got ourselves a nice smothered mate. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> that and, is um, dirty. The same thing if he just um, takes back with the rook. We, um, we also give this check first. Mm -hmm. King has to go back. If it goes forward, um, you take this guy and you sort of find some mate here it's not going to be not going to be very difficult to win some material here i'm pretty sure right definitely looks uh very promising. definitely doesn't look look pretty here even h5 and just win some stuff mm -hmm. so uh, marvin after thinking for a while ended up taking with the knight but uh there are very similar ideas here of course all of this i kind of have to calculate right you don't want to you know sack your your central pawn and take an f2 without being sure that it actually doesn't just lose everything right <laughs> But most of the lines are fairly forcing because he only has like one major alternative. So here, once again, we take an F2. White pretty much has to take, and I take here an E5. And mm -hmm. so um, he, he does have two options here. Once again, uh, take with the bishop and take with the rook. If he doesn't take, I'm up a pawn, and he's got this weak king. So um, rook takes is the move he didn't play, but it runs into this check. And if he goes back, uh, we actually just take the bishop. We're still threatening the rook. We're still threatening this check. And uh, this is just uh, game over for white, pretty much. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> Whoops. And so um, what he played was bishop takes. Uh, I gave this check with the knight, not allowing uh, the king to go this way. Mm -hmm. And he, this is where he runs into a, a, a swift and brutal mate. So if he goes back, we have the same theme here mm -hmm. of the, uh, the smothered mate once again. Very classic. Every... Schoolboy knows this one, I'm sure. It's, <laughs> it's one of the first ones that coaches show because it's just so pretty. Mm -hmm. And um, if he goes forward, which is what he did, um, I found a very nice way to win it. So if I give this check, he could actually run forward. And while the king is probably still going to be in big trouble there, I'm kind of out of checks for now, and I didn't really see a direct win. Mm -hmm. But instead, giving the check from, from this, this side first, um, forcing him to block, takes away the square on d4. So oh. if he goes back, this is made in one. Mm -hmm. uh, and by blocking, he takes away this escape square. And now I can give this check over here. And suddenly he doesn't have king to d4 anymore. Jeez. And he resigns wow. because this would be bishop g4 checkmate. Uh-huh. That was very precise. Wow. 
So a very nice uh, swift attacking game that I was kind of happy to uh, to show off to illustrate that I can play some attacking chess. Um, and the rest of the games are just gonna be uh, just gonna be smooth technical games. So uh, don't get don't get used to this, but I, I wanted to show something at least. I wanted yeah. to showcase. Yeah, no, that was that. great. That was excellent. I've never seen yeah. anything like that out of the French. Yes, the French is not as innocuous as people think. <laughs> Uh, all right, so for uh, the next two games, they both happened at events that were uh, more sort of significant to my, you know, chess career, so to speak. Okay. Um, this next uh, snippet that I'll show you, it's not the full game, but it is a, uh, a very nice um, finish from a game that I played um, in round six of the World Open. It was uh, against uh, Rafael Calderon. I'm sure you, you probably can pull up the study there. Okay. Yep, I have that. So this, uh, this game took place at the World Open in 2017, uh, which I ended up tying for first with seven and a half points out of nine. So uh, that was uh, the biggest sort of tournament win that I've had. It was the under 2200 section. Oof. And um, I ended up winning um, tied for first, which uh, gave me $7,000 in prizes. So that was, that was a great event for me. Mm -hmm. So this event, I started out really strongly. I won my first three games and um, I was feeling good. But then the round four and five, I made two draws. And... Of course, you're still fairly happy, you haven't lost the game yet, but with four out of five, it's pretty clear that I need a strong finish because to really get the big prizes, you need seven and a half or eight points usually. Right. And that meant out of the last four, I would need three and a half out of four at least. So this game was very crucial. I was playing a 2150, you know, pretty good player. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I was with the white pieces. So this game was an Alapin. Uh, we want to get some uh, Alapin baby emotes in the chat. I'll, I'll at least uh, put some in there myself. I'll put one in myself. Why not? My, uh, my favorite <laughs> opening with the white pieces. And, and the reason why I chose this game to show for the most part, we want to see some Alapins once in a while. Um, although the position doesn't really look that much like an Alapin. You could see something like this come from a Karo Khan or something else. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's been a, a positional grind. It's been very tense. Um, we both barely made it past the time control move 40, so we got a little bit of extra time. I think this this position is already around move 50. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I sort of uh, win the game from here was actually quite nice. I see Makayo's in the chat as well, saying Alapin Baby. So yes, like welcome, Makayo. <laughs> Makayo, good to see you. Getting ready for your match at 9 p.m., I'm sure, against Marcel. But um, I was playing a guy here at 2150 or so. Pretty important to get a win here, otherwise I pretty much need to win out. Okay. And so I had gotten this position here, and it's quite clear that I'm doing well with the white pieces. I've got, you know, the king is in the center on e4. Obviously, in the end game, you really want the centralized king. Right. Um, I've got potential pawn push with f5. I've got potential pawn push with g5, perhaps. Um, I also have, you know, the rook is coming to the open file, which is the first move that we'll see here. Rooks to c2, taking control of this file. Mm -hmm. And uh, the knight on d4 is very nice. It's blocking off his rook from moving forward, um, getting into my position, but also it's threatening potential jumps. But okay. the problem I have here is that. I need to still come up with a way to actually improve the position. So he goes king d7, taking away the entry squares. And so this is uh, sort of where kind of a classic, you know, Martin Hansen kind of game here where I'm just grinding, right? It's, it's an end game. I've been slightly better throughout the game in an Alpin. And, uh, and this is where the, I find a plan that I found just really filthy and I was really happy about it. So right here, the only way I can really break through is with the move f4, f5. Okay. And it's a good move. There's no doubt about it. That's something I want to do. Um, try to create a pass pawn, create a weakness on e6. Correct. But what I thought to myself in this position is, you know, what is Black's next move here? Because Black has very few constructive moves. He doesn't have a move with the rook. He doesn't have a good move with the king. You know, any king move would just be backwards. Mm -hmm. The knight doesn't really have good moves. You know, knight c8 or something. So I decided, what, what happens if I just wait? You know, let's say I, I play rook to c1, which is what I did. Okay. And so it's kind of a waiting move, but it's also actually kind of a Tuxwan kind of position here. So if he goes back, then I'm going to go f5, and I'm immediately hitting e6. So that was kind of my plan. Oh, um, just force him okay, to make okay. a move that, um, you know, that he doesn't really want to make. Slightly weakens his position, right? Slightly weakens his position. And what he ended up doing, uh, which probably he shouldn't have, but it's still a very difficult position for him. He went f6. Okay trying to break something open himself. The problem with the f6 move, though, is that it weakens this pawn on e6 anyway. So that's kind of the pawn that I wanted weakened. That's why I wanted to go f5 to begin with. Right. So the thing is, the, the move f6 actually doesn't really do all that much to help his position. In fact, he still doesn't really have any great moves. So the move I made here, and that I was kind of, kind of happy about, was just rook c2, just still waiting. 
I felt like this was just so filthy. I was so happy about this. You know, what is what does he want to play here? He still now he definitely can't move his king because mm -hmm. we take here. If he moves his knight, he's got to deal with knight c6 and uh, threaten some stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not easy to come up with a good plan. So he takes an e5, take an e5, and he goes g6. All right, so I'm actually curious uh, because we have the segment here, uh, psychology of competition. Um, mm -hmm. What do you believe that this move f6 a couple moves ago um, was a cause? He maybe just got impatient? That is definitely uh, a factor, right? No one really likes to just sit and wait um, because, you know, suffering is kind of not something you love doing. And mm -hmm. uh, just sitting around waiting for your opponents to eventually try to punish you is not very fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely a, a big way, you know, somebody like me who wins a lot of these games and end games and grinding positions that m my opponents eventually crack, right? It's not so much that I do something, you know, brilliant in those end games, but if you put pressure long enough, eventually they'll often try to lash out just because they're tired of waiting and, you know, it's just not very fun to defend for several hours in a worse position. And gotcha. so, so you got to be patient in these end games. Definitely, uh, definitely a very big, you know, learning point. If you look at, you know, Grandmaster stuff like that, something they're really good at is actually not beating themselves. That is often a key strength for GMs is that you're really going to have to beat them. They're not going to do these things that, you know, just lash out in positions that are otherwise, you know, not really cracking. Right. Um, here, I think I was probably winning anyway, but it's it's not easy. Um, but yeah, Zen vibes exactly, Matt, in the <laughs> chat, the emote, I like it. Uh, but he made the move G6 here. Once again, he, um, he didn't really have great moves otherwise. And as a um, when you're defending in general, you do want to trade off pawns because uh, to win an endgame like this, you need to have a pawn on the board, right? You cannot win with no pawns because you know you're not, you don't have anything to promote. Right. So even if you end up with, say, Rook and Knight against a Rook, it's just a draw. So you, trading off pawns is generally in the defender's favor. So he goes G6. And now the tactically inclined, if Makayo is still in chat, I'm sure is screaming for G5 to be played, and trying to queen the H pawn. And, uh, and that's all well and good that does actually win. But I'm not that guy, you know. I, I've just played Rook C2 to C1 to C2. Uh, my opponent is suffering. I wanted to keep it that way. So I went Rook C1 <laughs> back. Just really rubbing it in, you know. There's there no reason to rush. I was perfectly happy just uh, shuffling this Rook back and forth mm -hmm. and, uh, and watch him squirm. And so... What was the um, uh, time control like here, if you remember? Um, it was two hours for 40 moves, or like an hour and 40 for 40 moves, with 10 second delay, and 30 minutes after move 40. So we were probably down to 15 minutes each uh, wow. with delay, something like that. Holy, okay. Makai was looking for this breakthrough since the beginning of the game. That is the <laughs> standard breakthrough, yes. So if he goes G5, I'm pretty sure I would have gone Rook C2. I'm not entirely sure, but that's it, it feels right. But he took an H5 <laughs> and, went, and went Knight to C8. So finally, he sort of made a... Uh, a That's move true. that, you know, sort of brings away from, you know, the structure that he had right now. Mm -hmm. And so now it's finally time to actually make a break here. We go rook f1 and um, trying to get in there mm -hmm. uh, to f6. He goes king e7. And now, Matt, let me uh, let me test your tactics a little bit. What do you play here? <sighs> Goodness gracious. Um... What's the move that comes to mind? Well, you said tactics. I'm immediately thinking capturing something. There's only one capture on the board, and that's knight takes e6, but uh, I don't see... Wait. Oh, you can force the king back with rook f6. Oh. Exactly. Hey. So knight takes. So knight takes e6 is indeed the move. What I was kind of hoping for you to say was just to go rook f6, which uh -huh. looks great, right? You're hitting e6, you're hitting h6. What okay. could go wrong? But it actually runs into this devious move knight d6 check. Oh. Oh. <laughs> which would have made me uh, very, very sad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, if I take it, my rook is hanging uh -huh. very miserably. If I move the king, I have to keep the knight defended, right? I don't want to lose my knight. Um, let's say I go to like f3, takes the knight. I still can't take his knight because my rook's still hanging. So I have to go back to d3. He gets to take my pawn on e5. I take h6. We've had a lot of trades, and now it's probably a draw. The computer just says even. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so that just goes to show, you know, 50 whatever moves I've played in this game so far. Um, you know, countless of hours where I've been putting pressure. If you're not tactically alert, it can all disappear in an instant. And that would but just knight d6 would just be ouch. I did uh. see that in time though. I, I think my plan was rook f6 initially when I went rook f1, but uh -huh. I did see knight d6. And uh, I did find the move that you rightly pointed out, Matt. Knight takes e6. Okay. And so that is the move in this position. And uh, as you aptly pointed out, if he takes rook f6 check and we pick up his rook and the game is over. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just felt like this was uh, some nice technique, just shuffling the rook back and forth, waiting for him to crack, and uh, and also 
this uh, knight takes e6, not allowing that b6 there. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the game, we were sort of low on time. It was a little bit of dancing back and forth with the pieces until I settled on a plan. Right. The thing is, as long as I don't blunder anything here, um, there is really not that much of a rush. Keeping a very close eye on the b3 pawn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So finally, I decided here at this point um, just to give up the h pawn and go after his a, a pawn instead and just uh, queen that guy. So um, that's what I went for. He, he blundered with rook e4, but at this point, the pawn is kind of unstoppable. Right. The h pawn is way too slow. Mm -hmm. And so um, after rook e4, I gave this check and uh, he resigned because I win the rook. And, oh man, that's got to hurt. Because <laughs> so, um, both very, of you were sitting in that game for a long time. We were sitting there for six hours, and it was a key game. With that game, I was at, up at five points out of six. Um, I drew the, the seventh, but I managed to win the last two and uh, and got that tie for first with, with two other people. So and how about definitely, for him? Mm -hmm. definitely a key win there. How about for him? Was it a key game for him too? Uh, well, with the loss, he went down to four out, four out of six, so he's pretty much out of contention for first place at that point. It's kind of a, a merciless system, right? If you uh, mm -hmm. if you lose two points, you're not going to get first anymore in, in such a large field. And uh, I don't know how he ended up. I mean, he was a good player. He might have gotten some some points and even a prize, but right, um, not easy to do. But for someone knowing that they have to get a win or not a loss, it's probably very difficult to stay patient in yes, a position exactly. like that. <laughs> exactly. Rook C two, Rook C one. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that was that was. I, I really enjoyed that. That's that's my kind of uh, of grinding right there. I really enjoyed that. It sounds like it reminds me of Bobby Fisher saying, "Um, he he waits until life leaves the opponent's eyes or something like exactly. that." Exactly. <laughs> it was it was some suffering for him. That was for sure. Just seeing that rook being shuffled back and forth and not having any good moves to play. It's, it's <laughs> Um, all right. So I did have one more game that I wanted to show, okay. um, and this one had a little bit of a longer backstory. Um, which was, uh, this is a game from the European Youth Championship under 18, all the way back in 2008. Um, so I was playing, you know, I was in Denmark in the in the 2000s. I only moved to the States in 2010. I was originally Danish. And um, oh, welcome. <laughs> it, in, the, uh, in Denmark in those years, I think it's fair to say there was a little bit of a, of a top talent drought um, throughout like the, the 2000s. There were a few, few players who became GMs, but other than that, you had a lot of players like myself uh, who became, you know, decent masters, FMs, maybe a couple of IMs, but you didn't really have that generation of like a ton of GMs, okay. um, which meant that I was always fighting for the top couple of spots in the, uh, in the national championships. Um, and for me, one of the big goals that I had as a junior player was to qualify for one of the international events. Mm -hmm. um, so that included the Nordic Championships, um, the World Championship Youth Championship, and the World uh, and the European Youth Championship. And so, um, for year after year, I always just missed out on qualifying for all of those. Um, three times I finished third in the Danish Scholastic Championships, and the top two qualified for the Nordic Championship. I was always uh, kind of miserable. Um, I also missed out on a few spots to the uh, the World Youth and the European Youth. And so finally, in the under 18, I had my last chance. I tied for first at the Danish Championship. I was feeling good. But because there was only one spot going to the to the championship, I had to play a tiebreaker against the main rival that I had. And so um, we started off with two rapid games. I absolutely crushed him in the first game with White. I was feeling so good about myself. <laughs> and uh, in the second game, I promptly got destroyed myself. And so... We went to blitz games. I lost the first one, won the second one. So now I'm feeling good. I've got all the momentum. And mm -hmm. uh, we go to an Armageddon game that I ended up losing with the white pieces, much to my own dis dismay. Oh, no. I was like, every time I'm just so close and I just miss out. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't qualify uh, just because I lost that tiebreaker there in a heartbreaking fashion. But around one month before the event was about to start, um, this other guy pulled out. And so I actually ended up getting the spot anyway. And you know, I, I was happy. You know, I, I would take that any way I could get it. I, yeah. I wanted to play. And, um, you know, I was feeling good. I was playing some good chess around that time. And so I ended up going to um, the European Youth Championship under 18 in the, the very beautiful city of Herzegnovi in the country of Montenegro, which is in the former Yugoslavia area. Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. And so I went there and um, it was just a lot of fun. You know, I was representing Denmark in the under 18 section. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I started off really well. I was, it was the, the tournament where I had done by far the most prep ever, I think. I was so pumped, you know, I was working, I was doing a lot of prep. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the first round, I got paired against uh, a Bulgarian international master. So I was in the lower half of the event, um, rating wise, but not by a lot, but just enough that I got one of the top seats in the first round. And so I was black against this Bulgarian international master. And so the fun thing is my mom's also Bulgarian. And so I speak the language. Oh, cool. 
but he didn't know that, right? So I was playing him. I was playing with the black pieces and I got a very nice position. I was actually pressing him for most of the game, uh, but it ended in a draw. And so after the game, um, this Bulgarian guy, we were talking about the game and I said something Bulgarian. He looked at me like, wait, wait, how do you speak Bulgarian? <laughs> And I just told him, you know, they teach us a lot of languages in Denmark. You know, we got a we got a great education system over there. And he's just like, oh my goodness, he's like shaking his head. It's like I, I never told him. I, he just thinks that the Danes they all speak Bulgarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's really cool. Anyways, That's a nice little story at the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second round, I got the white pieces against the French international master, and I played the Alpin. Ooh, Alpin baby in chat. Alpin baby. Um, and I got completely destroyed. <laughs> so so much for the Alpin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got completely destroyed there in the Alpin. But the third game is the one that I wanted to show you guys uh, after this extended prelude. Uh-huh. Uh, and this it's is a 2008, that, correct? 2008, yeah. Awesome. So and so this is the game that I played awesome. against a Russian master um, around 2300 feet, eh? mm-hmm. um, which probably corresponds to close to 2400 USCF, I would guess. Um, and um, I got this, uh, this uh, game here. I'm playing him with the black pieces. Uh-huh. And um, this was during the time, you know, I was playing um, a couple of different things, but this was actually during the time where I was playing a lot of Rui Lopez with Black. Okay. And so the game started off with um, a mainline Rui Lopez. Um, and um, I didn't play the Marshall at the time. Uh, these days, the Marshall variation is all the rage. Uh, Black Castle's here. Mm-hmm. And after C3, they go D5, sacrifice this pawn, as was invented by Frank Marshall, I think, against Cabo Blanca back in the day. Okay. And um, I didn't do that. I just played d6, which is the more uh, quiet move, the, the old main line, so to speak. Right. c3, castle, h3. Very and scholastic. I went for knight a5. Yeah. So I played knight a5. This is known as the Chikorin variation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chikorin. Um, there's a lot of lines that black can choose here. Knight b8 is the briar. There are some lines with, I think, Romanesian played like bishop b7. There's the Karas, I think, with knight b7. There's so many lines here, and I think even a5 is a move. Wow, okay. Uh, but, <laughs> um, I was playing um, I was playing this uh, knight a5, bishop c2. Um, all of this has been played, you know, many thousand games. If we look at this, there's, you know, 4,000 4, games in the database from this position alone in the Masters uh, database in <laughs> chess. Oh and so um, I took on d4, knight c6, um, and this was my preparation going into the event. I played this a couple of times, and um, there are a couple of different lines that black can take, but taking on d4 and playing knight c6 is one of the main lines. Mm-hmm. And so white has a few options, but by far the main line is going knight to b3 to defend d4, and uh, a5, bishop e3, a4, and push the knight back to d2. This mm-hmm. is the main line. I played a few games in this. Bishop d7 happens, and you know, it's a classic uh, Spanish type position. White's going to go d5 probably at some point. Okay. He'll have a little bit more space. He'll try to batter up against b5, but black is also very solid, mm-hmm. and uh, he's eventually hoping to get some uh, some play of his own. On uh, move 16, you're saying that you've had a lot of games in this position. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's pretty standard stuff. It's, okay. uh, it's a Rui Lopez, yeah. Um, so the, the, order, the, the line that my opponent went for here mm-hmm. is a little bit more of a rare line. Although I did actually have this in a game against a, a GM once, um, which I also got a draw in. Mm-hmm. Um, I won this game that I'm showing, but I got a draw against a GM. He played d5. Uh-huh. Uh, the knight goes to b4, hitting the bishop. He's got to move it. Bishop b1. And so a3 is actually a threat to trap the bishop. So uh, white, black goes a5. Mm-hmm. a3, knight a6, and, uh, and b4. And the, the game that I actually played against the grandmaster in this exact line, yeah. he offered yeah. me a draw in this position. And um, I... Oh. I immediately accepted and the reason was apparently he just flown in for the tournament the day before and he was really tired or whatever but i'll, I'll take the draw you know yeah I'm, I'm seriously not, uh, against gm why not <laughs> i'm not opposed to draw with black against the gm here from, uh, <laughs> slightly worse but perfectly playable uh weird lopez position mm-hmm. but against uh against mr kutenev here i was uh i was definitely just looking to play a um, very solid position here with black a couple of a couple different options here you can go bishop d7 um or you can take mm-hmm um, the general rule of thumb is whenever white's gone d5 in a Rui Lopez, okay. you always want to put the bishop on d7, not on b7. Okay. Um, and the idea is basically that on b7, the bishop is doing absolutely nothing in general because it's just pointing towards a pawn chain that's not going to be moved anytime soon. Right. And, and would so, it be a, a positional blunder to play a, a4? To go a4? Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's kind of my knee-jerk going, reaction. The problem with going a4, I think, is that you sort of don't have any squares for this knight anymore. Um, I think that's kind of the main issue. Um, I don't know if the computer will like it or not, but I think in general it just doesn't look good. Okay. Just because you can see the knight on a6 is completely shut out of the game, right? It doesn't have this square. 
you know, where, where is it going to go? And the computer just doesn't really like it. Okay. Uh, white's going to put pressure on B5. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we need to have some pressure in B4 to sort of match that. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I took on B4 instead, um, which is uh, fine. I mean, white is slightly better in these. He's got a little bit more space, mm-hmm. but black is pretty solid. And so um, bishop to D7, uh, you know, which is the square we want the bishop when white is on D5, also defending this, uh, this pawn. Right. And uh, we're just developing here. I went rook C8, not the other rook. We don't want to hang this knight. Right. <laughs> and... Um, Queen goes to b7. Also fairly standard. You don't usually put it on b6 because a lot of times you actually want that square for the bishop later on. Ah, okay. Because the bishop on e7 is, um, you know, not really doing a whole lot right now. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times you just uh, play some slow maneuvering chess right here. You don't really want to do something um, too rash necessarily. Um, you could sometimes go for f5, but oftentimes you do see some uh, some slow maneuvering stuff. And also the queen here is defending the rooks. Um, you know, if there's some trades along the, those files. Mm-hmm. If so I'm not, went basically, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in this position, you seem to be very comfortable, even though you, you may be slightly worse, less space, a little cramped. Yeah, um, I was pretty happy in this position. I, I wasn't too worried. It's you know fairly standard. Um, White is probably not unhappy either. He's got his usual ideas. You know, he can bring the knight over here if he wants to. Mm-hmm. Um, he can also you know try to bring the knight over on the queen side. to a five. That's what he does. Okay. Um, and he'll normally try to put some pressure on b5 eventually. But it's not that easy to um, to really do a whole lot. It's going to be a slow game. It's going to be some uh, maneuvering going on. Gotcha. So he went bishop to d3. Uh, um, logical move. If you actually look in the database, there's been two games even in this position. It's move 21, so it's kind of surprising. But um, it is just fairly you know, logical, I, I think, the, the moves that have happened so far. Mm-hmm. I went knight h5. So this is a very standard idea. We want to bring the knight to f4. This is a very nice square for the knight in this position. And similarly, white often wants to bring the knight to f5 if he can. And uh, the problem white has is he'd like to go g3 to not give up the square. But that would actually lose his h3 pawn here. Right. So he can't actually do that. And so um, he just uh, continues with with his own plan. He goes knight b1, wants to transfer it um, over here to put pressure on the b5 pawn, I think. I think that was the idea. Okay. But it's it's some slow maneuvering stuff. And at this point, we're actually out of any known games so far. <laughs> so the knight comes f4, bishop f1. White still cannot go g3 because the pawn will still be hanging. So the knight is kind of um, there for, for the time being. Mm-hmm. And um, I go knight c7. So the knight on a6 is not doing all that much. I definitely have some options here. But, um, you know, the knight isn't really putting that much pressure in b4. So I decided to redirect it. Um, and, um, you know, what I, I really wanted to do was kind of what happened in the game is to redirect it um, this way and bring it to one of these squares over here. <laughs> what maneuvering. <laughs> maneuvering, yes. And uh, the thing is, in the uh, in this kind of position, you can sometimes, you know, you need to think strategically. You need to think, you know, how do I improve the position of my pieces long term? Right. And so I went knight c7. Um, if he trades here, I immediately take with the knight, mm-hmm. which helps this plan. Um, he doesn't. He goes knight d2. I took, I went along with this plan here. He goes to c3. So what he's trying to do right now is actually to stop this idea because he's got pressure on b5. Right. But the thing is, it doesn't actually stop it um, because I do have some tactics if he goes ahead and takes that. So it's a little bit of a mix of maneuvering with, uh, with you know, calculating the small tactics here. It's uh, what Capablanca used to call la petite combinaison or something like that. I don't know. I'm not. Okay, uh, so you guys on YouTube, feel free to pause your video see if you figure out the uh, tactical idea on uh, so uh, Yeah, it is kind of, you know, simple, but the thing is, um, because the knight is now kind of loose, mm-hmm. we can actually take here. So um, now the queen hey. is going to be hitting that knight as well. Nice. So if he were to take on, um, on d5, we just take back. And now this pawn on d5 is actually going to be really loose. In fact, I think he's just going to lose this guy. And uh, it's equal material right now already, right? I took the knight in b5. So um, the only real alternative for white is to take in d6. So we're both giving up our knights to try to gain the most value from them, knowing that you know they're about to get captured, right? So he takes here, mm-hmm. I take here. He could take the knight, but doesn't want to do that. So he tries to give up the knight for another pawn before it gets captured. Mm-hmm. The thing is we just take, um, he takes in d5. And here, a really nice move is just to take um, this guy on b4. Oh. Okay. So the thing is, white actually has a lot of issues in this position if he goes for this whole uh, sequence because the knight's being hit on d2, the pawn on d5 is still quite weak. 
And, um, you know, I have the rook that can come in eventually. I have the, uh, you know, the bishops can suddenly get really strong pointing towards the king side. And so actually the only move that kind of holds the balance here for white, um, not easy to see, but it is queen to a2. Okay. I'm surprised Avoiding... that queen takes doesn't work. <laughs> queen takes is just not a very good move just because this uh, is actually going to cause you a lot of problems, this pin here. Okay. Let's say uh, rook b1, term. possibly bishop to a4. Mm -hmm. And... I didn't see that the knight was hanging right, right. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Whoops. <laughs> he decided not to take on b5, uh, which is definitely understandable. And instead he went uh, king to h2. So the point of this move is another sort of slow move, is that now he's actually getting ready to kick the knight away. It's a very standard idea. Mm -hmm. Now if he can go g3, I no longer can take this guy because he's got two defenders on it. And so um, I just continue on with my plan. You know, I redirected the knight all the way from here. I might as well bring it somewhere useful. Mm -hmm. And so I played knight to a4. And, um, and this is kind of a fairly nice square for the knight. So if you were to take this guy, I take with the pawn, and now I have the outside pass pawn here on the A file. Plus the B pawn is still going to be pretty weak. Let's say I go rook B8 next. Mm -hmm. He's going to have uh, some issues trying to hang on to that one long term. So not really um, a trade that he'd really uh, want to do. So he just goes um, G3, which was the plan anyway. And I ended up uh, trading here in C3. I don't know if that was the correct move. I think uh, I could have just dropped the knight. Um, the computer even wants H5, which I thought looked a little bit odd at the time. But actually, uh, it says, you know, just trying to say that F6 square is the better one. Um, okay. So I can put more pressure on the king side. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, let's say I go F5, knight F6, something like that. Right. I, I ended up trading here first just to get rid of the piece that was hitting B5, I think. Mm -hmm. um, he takes back. I don't think he has time to take an F4 um, just because the king gets open. I probably just dropped the knight back. You don't really want to open up your king like this, I think. Right, especially with all those pieces pointing at it. <laughs> so many pieces still on the board, exactly. So that's one of the fun things about the Ruiz Lopez. If you look at this position, we've played, you know, 28 moves or so. Mm -hmm. We've only had one pair of rooks get traded off of all the pieces, right, and, and a few pawns. Wow. So a lot of stuff still on the board here. It's a very, very slow maneuvering game. Mm -hmm. So um, I threw in this uh, intermezzo here, queen a7, a move that I kind of liked. Really Putting cheeky. pressure on F2. Mm -hmm. Cheeky move, yeah. You don't want to take um, because I take here and I take his rook. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it kind of forces him to make a move that he doesn't really want. So King G1 to defending it hangs this pawn. So what he needs to do is to play the move rook to E3. But that kind of takes the rook away from the square it really wants to be on, right? He gives up the first rank mm -hmm. uh, where it's probably better. And also it runs into this idea that um, I'm going to be playing a few moves. I first have to re remove the knight from threat. Um, he tries to do some maneuvering as well. But now comes this idea that I had talked to you about already um, right out of the opening. We bring the bishop to this square. Jeez. <laughs> and because the rook has already been forced to e3, it's not going to get there with tempo. Because we're going to hit the rook when we get there. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's been some slow maneuvering, but there's also you know some points to it. Yeah, you didn't um, touch that bishop for 20 moves and all of a sudden... Yes. Bishop's been there since move 6 or something. <laughs> so he goes uh, rook back. I went um, bishop here. He throws in rook to a2, which is kind of uh, a nice idea, you know, uh, hitting my queen so I don't have time to take the pawn on f2. Right. I went queen to c7. Maybe I should have just gone to b7 right away since that's where I ended up. Um, after bishop d3, I didn't really see a lot to do on the c7 square. And um, I think I, I don't even remember why I went back to b7 here, but. Um, I think according to the engine, queen b7 was not bad, but I, it also wanted me to start pushing this h pawn, which is, you know, more of a computer kind of idea. You know, these days everyone's pushing their h pawns all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, we've played a lot of moves here. The position is still fairly equal. Um, you know, there's been a lot of maneuvering. I've put this bishop on a good square. Uh, I've got a lot of pieces on this file here, but I still need to, you know, find something to do. And in the meantime, you know, I'm defending this pawn. Mm -hmm. It's been a slow game. That's uh, It's my kind of game right here. And his knight so, is kind of tied down at the moment. Yeah, so I find this plan. I go to b7. Uh, mm -hmm. The knight comes to a3. I think that's why I won the queen here, actually, to keep this pawn defended um, through you know, the bishop. So bishop d4, that was the idea. Okay. And so now, if you were to take, um, I take here. I'm threatening to bring the rook in. I have this square for the knight. And uh, there are a lot of nice things. So the, because the queen's in b7, and this one's defended. The rook can go there. Um, not really what white wants to do. I mean, it, it, on first glance, you're giving him, you know, he's giving me double pawns, but it's also a passer and it gives me a lot of uh, ideas. Right. So he decided uh, just to not allow that. Just goes rook c2. We see a trade of bishops. And um, I do I do this move here. Once again, hitting this f2 pawn right here, um, forcing him to 
do something about it. So he trades off the rooks. He has to defend on g2. We go bishop d7. And it looks like, you know, we've had a lot of simplifications. Um, we're down to what looks to be kind of an, uh, more of an endgame at this point. Still mm -hmm. same pawn structure as we've had the whole time, pretty much. And this, but this is, is where... Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, this come up on move 40. Did you guys have a, anchor, or a time control? Uh, probably, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if we were in time trouble. I don't recall, but... but time control, been some, I'm uh, sorry. Been some yeah, I don't know if we, were, uh, if we were low on the clock here. I don't recall that. But I'm, I'm pretty sure there was move, more time at move 40 for sure. Right, okay, gotcha, gotcha. They went queen c3, um, 97. So now I'm preparing perhaps to go uh, for some f5. Mm -hmm. Also considering bringing this knight here in the long term and bringing it, in, bringing it somewhere. Uh, but, but mainly on g6, you know, it just has no prospects, right? It's not going here, it's not going here. So we want to redirect that knight to somewhere useful. Right. Um, so the queen went back to b7 as well, taking away some entry squares, preparing perhaps this route. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to get exciting in a second. You'll see. There's a reason why I showed you this game. All right. <laughs> but I did warn you, you know, I wanted to show one quick attack so I could uh, justify showing this uh, this grind right <laughs> Not here. Not a problem at all. I mean, we had a lot of tactical fun with Jan last week. So absolutely oh, man. good for a good change here. Taking some digs at, uh, at my grind of grinding style instead. All right. I, I like it. <laughs> I love grinding. I mean, I got to learn it's, how to grind better. It's, it's all good. Uh, so, okay, he actually has an idea now, though. He goes queen a5, first of all, threatening this check, mm -hmm. and also trying to gang up on this pawn here in b5. So I need to um, to be a little bit precise here, a little bit careful, but I do have an idea. And so, so this is where it actually gets sharp, on move 43 or so. Okay. So I go queen to c8, I'm hitting the pawn in h3. And so also, if you were to go h4, mm -hmm. I also have some play with bringing the bishop and the queen in, and suddenly we're doing some attack ideas. Okay. What he decides to do is to give up on this pawn right away, because h4, it's still kind of an attack. And g4, I probably go h5 right away, or I go knight g6 f4. Lots of ideas there for black. Right. Or I just sacrifice. My, uh, honestly, it's also possible that I can just uh, sack and immediately at least get a draw. Mm -hmm. So what he did was he went knight a3. And so this is where it becomes quite critical. So I take the pawn and king h2. And so if I don't have anything here, um, he's going to take this pawn on b5. And he's going to have pressure on d6. Plus the pawn on, b, on b4 is going to be very hard to stop. Right. Right. Because how do I actually stop it? So I need to do something um, very nice right around here. And so this is where I found a very nice move, which is uh, the reason I'm showing this game to begin with. Um, because actually sacrificing two pieces here, oh, okay. um, and I only have two pieces and the queen on the board. I go queen to g4. So the first thing to notice is white can go queen to d8 check and take the knight. Right. So that's obviously um, that's obviously the key line. And so when calculating queen g4, I needed to make sure I actually had something here because mm -hmm. otherwise I'm just going to be down a piece. So right. the point is, if he goes queen to d8 and takes the the, the horse. Um, I go queen to f3, also a very nice move, mm -hmm. because we're threatening mate, so he has to take our bishop. But hold on, we're down two pieces, right? But this is where his king is running awfully low on squares. I could take the bishop, but if I do, I'm never actually playing for a win, right? If, if anything, I'm probably just going to lose after, you know, take an f7, he can take this guy. So we have to have a mate here. So queen h1 check, Oh my god. queen g4, and h5. <laughs> And so he is running very much low on squares right here. Um, basically, um, you know, he has two two legal moves. One is to go here, mm -hmm. after which he's immediately made it um, like this. So what he has to go for um, is to go forward. And so my plan was just to go f6 here. The computer says queen f3 is made. Um, that's fine too. But f6 was my idea. Or forcing. Him, forcing him to give up the queen, yeah, which just ends the game because this... Um, you give this check, and uh, it's going to be a made a roux. <laughs> One heck of an attack there, jeez. Yeah, and with only a queen left, so a very nice uh, very nice idea. So that's kind of why I was really happy with this game, this queen g4, sacrificing this one with the idea of sacrificing this one, um, and just calculating the fact that he's going to get mated if he tries to take my pieces there. Very nice. And, and uh, uh, of course... Your opponent had, pause here for a bit? He's probably. I think he spent a long time on this move, but the problem is he doesn't really have any good ways to uh, to you know get out of this if he can't take my pieces. And mm -hmm. so, um, I played Queen G4. You know, I got up from the board. I was strolling around. You know, I was like, I I'd, I'd seen the mate there. I knew that he couldn't take, and uh, I was just waiting for, for him to to do something. I was feeling good. 
Hey, Sammy. So after, <laughs> Sorry. Sammy's here. Hey, Sammy. I'm, I'm just showing off one of the finer moves from my youth career, Sammy. Queen G4. Uh, let me show it for Sammy. Absolutely. Just with the idea it. that it sacrifices two pieces here, but if he takes, it leads to a... Uh, a forcing uh, mate. <laughs> forcing checkmate. Ooh. Dirty, dirty. That's what we call dicey. That was dicey for white. Uh -huh. So after this move, queen to g4, he's not able to give me this check and take the knight because queen f3, giving up the bishop to does lead to a mate. And so what he ended up doing was just to go knight c2, queen f2, knight, uh, queen f3, knight e3. But this is just desperate and um, just loses a lot of stuff. So after this, I took the pawn in f2 with check. I took an e3, so I'm up two pawns and a piece, but he takes the piece um, back. Okay, he takes an h3, so not, not of a piece. I'm up two pawns here. Right. But the thing is, I'm threatening stuff like knight g6 to f4 too. So if I can get the if I get the knight in play, he's also in trouble. Plus, I'm hitting the bishop. Mm -hmm. So what he ended up doing was trying to find some uh, salvation in the queen end game. He went queen d8 check, mm -hmm. took the knight, I took on d3. This I'd also seen when I was uh, probably not when I went queen g4. I probably saw this when I went uh, queen f3 in the next move. Mm -hmm. But basically, um, I'm up a pawn right. I'm up two pawns right now. And he's not really going to have a way to um, to save anything here. Okay. Sammy's saying he just played a shogi game against computer and won. Nice. Nice. Shogi's hard. I love it. Shogi, I've never really played that. So you take an F7. I'm threatening to uh, give a perpetual check, but of course we take an E4, mm -hmm. covering this uh, this line as well. It's diagonal. Give a few checks just to uh, save some time on the clock in case I was low on time. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And then H5. So now this would be a mate. So... Um, Needs to do something about it. He has to run backwards. I give a check and I go to g6. So the check forces him away from the defense of this guy. Mm -hmm. I think if he goes back, I just go here. Pawn in game is always winning because I just have an extra pawn that's protected. Right. And so um, he instead went to d7. We took this guy. Took this guy. He only has um, a couple of checks here. Queen mm -hmm. d7, king h6, and he's going to be out of them. Fresh out of checks. So he went to uh, he went to g5. Gave one more check. I went here. Once again, threatening to uh, trade off those queens. Mm -hmm. King went back. I started pushing the passers. He's got no checks, no prospects. And here he did resign. And uh, I just, uh, I really like this game. I like the queen g4. I like the slow maneuvering grind. You know, beating a Russian at the world youth or at the Euro European youth was always uh, a nice feat as well. So Yeah, that, um, that uh, maneuver, knight a8, knight b6, knight c4, that was that was a very nice find there. Yeah, you gotta you gotta play those slow positions. You gotta maneuver. You know, you can't just look for immediate ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just gotta be patient and uh, and try to uh, improve the position of your worst placed piece. That is a, a well known rule. And uh, I'm curious of what areas of the game that um, uh, I guess from your family, your mother and father, who have taught you chess. Uh, what what did they teach you most about the game? Was it end game, opening, middle game, strategy? I think it was definitely more of uh, end game and sort of strategy middle game stuff like that mm -hmm. um have i discussed with not beating josh last night no <laughs> that should also be on this achievements but you beat I josh, josh last night i beat josh in a few blitz games last night just oh I, okay i thought sammy did it okay uh sammy did not know okay uh, but yeah i think it was mostly uh strategy mostly um you know end games particular i think my dad was always great in end games he wrote a full book um that was been published about end games uh called Secrets of Endgame Technique, or Secret of Endgame something. Yep. Very good book. I, I read it, um, you know, many years ago and learned a lot from that. And so I think it was always that. And any time I played a few games, you know, at a tournament or something, you know, we'd go through the game with my parents. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about, you know, the plans, the ideas, you know, what do I actually want to look for in this position? There was never really a lot of opening theory. Mm -hmm. I could always just pick up a book and learn that for myself. But it was always a lot about, you know, just how to think about chess, how to think about certain positions. And I always really like the maneuvering aspect of it, the positional grind, the slow end games. And mm -hmm. so I think that's what I, I picked up the most, more so than uh, a lot of attacks. That makes sense. That's That was why I asked the question. I was wondering if your style of play came from that. Yep. <laughs> and uh, from Roy Lopez, from my experience growing up in chess, I always thought of it as the most tactical attacking type of uh, opening, but you showed me a very deep, strategical type of game that completely uh that, that was very new to me i like seeing that thank you it depends on how it's played yeah there are there are a lot of lines that are really quiet like similar to what you see uh, these days in the italian game that's played a lot you get a lot of really uh, slow you know positional games but sometimes you'll see you know quick attacks in the Rui lopez sometimes white will attack on the king side and you'll see something really uh, 
really spicy there. So uh -huh. it all depends on the, on how the sort of the early middle game unfolds to uh, what kind of plans you're going to be going for in the in the middle game. All right. Well, thank you so much, Martin. I, I really enjoyed watching all this, and I learned a lot too. Um, and I was trying to be instructive and at the same time here. Dude, it was excellent. I loved it. Seriously. Uh, I learned a lot of the areas of the game that I'm probably weakest in, too. <laughs> um, also, you do uh, group lessons or private lessons as well? Um, I do private lessons, uh, but I don't really do group lessons right now. Okay. I have in the past, but right now, you know, I'm open to taking private students if that's the case. But right now, I'm mostly focused on, um, you know, just the, the events that I'm organizing, stuff like that. So, right, school and work. Mm -hmm. not, not in school right now, but work, you know. Uh, organizing that kind of stuff is kind of what I really enjoy doing these days. Gotcha. Well, definitely on YouTube, guys. Go ahead and follow Martin on Orlando Chess House. They have a lot of excellent content on there. I'm sure you'll have yep. a great time checking them out. Uh, any final Absolutely. words, Martin? Um, no. I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed talking to you guys. Thank you for having me on here. I love the stuff that you guys are doing. See, you do you do a lot of streams. Sammy, do, Sammy does some streams and Brian does as well. It's It's always a lot of fun. Sammy says he will hire you as a coach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds I'm good. Done.